Most members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints have a patriarchal blessing. Each of these lists their lineage within the tribes of Israel. Many misunderstand this lineage, which we'll talk about in a moment. Patriarchal blessings also state that this tribe lineage relates to responsibilities you have as well as blessings that you can receive by being true and faithful. President Monson once said, quote, The same Lord who provided a liahona for Lehi provides you and me today a rare and valuable gift to give direction to our lives, to mark the hazards to our safety, and to chart the way, even safe passage, not to a promised land, but to our heavenly home. The gift to which I refer is known as a patriarchal blessing. Every worthy member of the church is entitled to receive such a precious and priceless personal treasure. I believe that some of the most powerful blessings and warnings in our patriarchal blessings can be a little hidden within the lineage that we are pronounced with. Why does this matter? Our lineage back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob enable us to access the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. I think President Nelson said it best. He said, quote, We need to gain that heavenly perspective. We need to know about the Abrahamic covenant and understand our responsibility in helping to bring about the promised gathering of Israel. We need to know why we are privileged to receive patriarchal blessings and learn of our connection to ancient patriarchs. We need to know that Jacob's son Joseph became the birthright son after Reuben lost his birthright. Joseph and his sons Ephraim and Manasseh became the seed to lead in the gathering of Israel. Other tribes were to follow. So understanding our lineage is important. In the early years of this dispensation of the fullness of times, nearly all members of the church seemed to fall into either the tribe of Ephraim or Manasseh. My guess is that you, as you watch this, are likely one of these two tribes, as they are still the most predominant tribes of current members of the church. The responsibilities and blessings of these two tribes are the most well known. However, in recent years, some members, especially those in non-North America and European countries, have received patriarchal blessings with lineages of other tribes. The blessings and responsibilities of the other tribes are not nearly as well known, so I thought today's video should be on lineage. Patriarchal blessings aren't something our church made up. Adam gave patriarchal blessings to his children. Joseph Smith taught in Doctrine and Covenants 107, 53 to 57, I saw Adam in the valley of Adam on Diamond. He called together his children and blessed them with a patriarchal blessing. The Lord appeared in their midst, and he, Adam, blessed them all, and foretold what should befall them to the last generation. This verse makes an important point. Patriarchal blessings are to foretell the future as well as to identify responsibilities and blessings. Now, I hate videos where you want the speaker to get right to the point because you already have all of the background. You just want to cut to the chase. But for those not familiar with this subject in depth, we need to give some context. So I apologize to those that already know this information. So first, quickly, what are the 12 tribes of Israel? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are some of the most well-known Old Testament prophets. Jacob, Abraham's grandson, had his name changed to Israel. Jacob, now Israel, had 12 sons including Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulon, Joseph, and Benjamin. That is from oldest to youngest. The progenitors of each of these individuals became the members of that tribe. So the sons and daughters of Reuben were part of the tribe of Reuben. The sons and daughters of Gad are members of the tribe of Gad, and so forth down to through the generations. Reuben lost the birthright, a double portion, which was given to Rachel's, the second wife's, firstborn, which is Joseph, although he was 11th in the overall birth order. For more information on this, there is a video called Birthright that you should watch. Israel adopted Joseph's children, Manasseh and Ephraim, as his own, making their own tribe. So if you see the tribe of Joseph, know that Ephraim and Manasseh are the two tribes that come from him and effectively replace Joseph as an independent tribe. So when a patriarchal blessing states a lineage, what does that mean? Some believe lineage is purely physical or genealogical in that your great, 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 great grandfather back 4,000 plus years ago was Ephraim. Others believe that it is only spiritual. Still others believe it is adoptive or related to earthly callings and responsibilities. In reality, it is all of these. 
See, from a biblical perspective, there are those in the house of Israel, literal descendants of Israel as described above, and everyone else is a Gentile. In other words, not of the house of Israel, i.e. not a descendant of Israel without any progenitor link to Israel the prophet. We are currently living in the time of the Gentiles, when the Gentiles have the gospel and take it to the world. But that can be a bit misleading. Many people believe that they are not physically from the house of Israel, but are only adopted in. For the vast majority of us, this is not true. Nearly all of us in the church today are literal descendants of Israel. Joseph Fielding Smith said, quote, Every person who embraces the gospel becomes of the house of Israel. In other words, they become members of the chosen lineage or Abraham's child through Isaac and Jacob, unto whom the promises were made. The great majority of those who become members of the church are literal descendants of Abraham through Ephraim, son of Joseph. Those who are not literal descendants of Abraham and Israel must become such. And when they are baptized and confirmed, they are grafted into the tree and are entitled to all the rights and privileges as heirs. What does that mean? Think of it this way. You have two parents who have two parents and so forth back generation after generation. If you go back 30 generations, that is over 1 billion ancestors from which you have come. If even one of them is a descendant of Israel, you are from the house of Israel. What are the odds of that? Well, nearly 100%. In fact, it is statistically and genetically almost impossible for you to not be genetically from all 12 tribes of Israel. See, Israel lived about 4,500 years ago, which is something like 130 generations back, your 130th great-grandfather. Going back even 1,000 years gives you three times more progenitors than the entire population of the earth at that time, which can happen due to a lot of overlap. And that is just 1,000 years, let alone 4,500. For more information on this, watch the video on the 10 tribes returning. But needless to say, unless you are from a remote area of Asia or a few other places with your ancestors being purely from that region for thousands of years, it is highly likely that you are not only physically descended from Israel, but likely from all 12 of the tribes. Yes, you would likely have ancestors from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, especially if you have any family from Europe, Scandinavia, Australia. Eastern Bloc countries, Arabic countries, India, or anywhere in North America. This is quite easily confirmed by genetics, DNA, and math. Think of it this way. To not be physically from any of the house of Israel means that not a single one of your ancestors can be a descendant of any of the 12 tribes, because even if one of them was, you would have a direct line back. But as Joseph Fielding Smith said, if you are one of the few that isn't a physical descendant, then upon baptism into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you are adopted into the house of Israel. At the same time, a literal descendant that is not baptized and not part of the covenant do not receive the blessings even though they are a literal descendant. So then, with all of us in the house of Israel, and likely from all of the tribes physically, why does our patriarchal blessing specify one tribe for our lineage? That is because your identified lineage in your patriarchal blessing is more about a spiritual calling in addition to your genealogical heritage. It is telling you what your responsibilities are during your mortal journey, individually as well as to the rest of humanity, and offers blessings with that calling. Just like you get a temporary calling in church, this is a lifelong calling that you have directly from your Heavenly Father. Wendy Nelson, the prophet's wife, on June 15, 2013, was speaking at a sister missionary conference in Russia and felt prompted to ask the sisters to stand when their tribe was called as it was listed in their patriarchal blessing. To many people's astonishment, 11 different tribes were present, and at their next stop in Armenia, the 12th was there. This means that while early in the dispensation of the fullness of times, most were identified in the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh, but today people are receiving blessings where all of the tribes are being identified. It is quite well known the responsibilities and blessings that Ephraim and Manasseh received by being true and faithful, but little is known about the other tribes and their responsibilities and blessings. So the rest of this video is going to discuss the blessings of all of the 12 tribes. 
First, let me say that it is likely that over time, I believe that more will be revealed on this subject and certainly more in the individual blessings of those called to these other tribes. But for now, we can look to the scriptures for clues about these other tribes' responsibilities and blessings. In an attempt to do this, there are a few approaches that we can take to identify blessings, responsibilities, and warnings given to either of the 12 sons individually or their associated tribes. The first is the meaning of their names. The second is the individual blessings Israel gave to each of these children just before he died in Genesis 48 and 49. The third is the blessing Moses gave each of the tribes at the end of his life. And a fourth could be at looking at the stories of those in the Bible from particular tribes. Here is a list of the tribes. Yes, there are 14 listed here because both Joseph and his two sons are on the list, including the meanings of their names. Now look, for me, it is difficult to give this much credence. For example, Levi means the cleric. We know that the Levites were the priesthood holders from just after the Exodus onwards until Christ's ministry. So a meaning of the cleric sounds prophetic. But did Levi come to be known as the cleric as the result of his priesthood responsibilities? Or did Levi truly mean that when he was named that by his mother? Either way, we will move on and you can associate these names individually later and find other connections if you wish. The account in Genesis 49 where Israel gives the blessing to his children is given in their birth order. For whatever reason, in Deuteronomy 33, Moses follows what some scholars believe to be a geographic or position relative to the tabernacle, east to west among the southern tribes and then the northern tribes. But for whatever reason, the order is different in Deuteronomy. Keep in mind as well that in Genesis 49, we have a father giving blessings to individual children. And in Deuteronomy 33, we have a prophet giving blessings to an entire tribe of people. I say this because many of the things spoken of in Genesis are specific to the child. That being said, even in Genesis 49, it starts by saying, quote, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. I say this because a patriarchal blessing is meant to speak about the future with warnings, responsibilities, and blessings for the faithful, so we can learn from each of these and apply them to our lives. I'm going to place the individual blessings and the tribal blessings side by side as we go through them in their birth order. Also, reading all of this would take way too long, so I'll list some takeaways, but feel free to study these individual blessings on your own. Individually, Reuben is chastised for his infidelity with Bilhah, and he's called unstable as water. Robert D. Hales once said, Think for a moment about what the phrase unstable as water means. When water gets hot, it evaporates. When it gets cold, it freezes. When it is unchanneled, it causes erosion and destroys whatever may be in its path. As bearers of the Aaronic priesthood, you too have a birthright. I challenge you to not let your resolve dribble out and your commitment to follow the Savior evaporate. Be firm as a rock in living the gospel. None of us know all of the blessings that await us. The only way we can lose the blessings is to give them up through disobedience. Don't give up your eternal heritage for the things of this world. Let us be obedient and prepare now to honor, protect, and receive our glorious birthright. By the way, I find this a great way to study. Find unique terms like unstable as water and research what that means and find the other places in scripture where that term is used. Notice that this might not sound like much of a patriarchal blessing from what we get individually today. Some even say that it is difficult or impossible to derive some tribe's responsibilities and warnings and blessings from such short verses for each tribe. I would encourage you to look at the blessings and then compare that to the following history of that tribe. Then, with that context, attempt to find the warnings and blessings. For example, with Reuben, in both blessings, Reuben is listed first, but he is evaluated differently in each. In Genesis, as noted above, Reuben, the person, is castigated due to his sin, whereby he lost the birthright. While in Deuteronomy, Moses expresses the hope that Reuben, the tribe, will survive, specifically referring to their small numbers. There is a clear warning here of thou shalt not commit adultery with severe consequences and outcomes. Another thing to keep in mind as you read these is that you are likely from all 12 tribes. And while you have a specific calling and responsibility associated with your named tribe, I believe these warnings are for all and the blessings can apply to the entire house of Israel. 
Thus, we can all learn that if we don't keep the law of chastity, our blessings will be severely limited and we will lose our spiritual birthright of gaining all the Father has. Much like Reuben's blessing focusing on past sins, Simeon and Levi are reprimanded for their slaying of the Sheshemites in an epically cruel manner. So in Genesis, Simeon is combined with Levi, and for whatever reason, Simeon is not given a blessing by Moses in Deuteronomy. Later, translations of the Bible add Simeon back in as part of Judah's blessing, as most Simeonites lived among the Jews, but these were not inspired additions. Simeon and Levi were to be scattered throughout Israel, which happened as Simeon shared the lands with Judah. We can learn that anger and violence can lead to a loss of earthly and eternal blessings. The opposite is the case with Levi, who in Genesis 49 is rebuked together with his brother Simeon, but in Deuteronomy 33, Levi receives a very substantial four-verse-long blessing in which he is praised for his loyalty to Jesus Christ and given the priesthood. There may not be any doctrinal basis for this, but I look at these two brothers getting a combined blessing due to combined sins, but then getting very different regard later as one is not even mentioned and the other one rained down with blessings including the holy priesthood. Could this be a lesson in the value of repentance and obedience? Although we may sin, if we repent, we may lose some of our earthly reward, but our eternal reward will still be intact. A more extreme switch can be seen with the treatment of the tribe of Judah. In Genesis 49, Judah is given a lengthy blessing in which he is described as a crouching lion and given the leadership over his brothers. In Deuteronomy 33, however, Judah receives a paltry one verse, whose theme is the hope that he can stand up to his adversaries. On the whole, Judah, for more of the Old Testament period, remained more faithful to the worship of Jehovah than did the northern kingdom. Christ the King will come through this line. However, they will not accept him at first, but in the last days they will. Quote, and one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. So perhaps one of the lessons is to believe in Christ and follow him in order to have and maintain blessings in this life and the life to come. The fact that Dan is called a snake by his father sheds lights on the future dark dealings of this tribe. In particular, the tribe of Dan was allotted fertile land in Canaan, but failed to conquer the area. Although God promised that the tribe would ultimately possess the land, the tribe took matters into its own hands and invaded a peaceful nation to take that land instead. Moreover, the tribe began worshiping idols. Notably, the tribe of Dan is omitted from the tribes of Israel mentioned in the tribulation in Revelation 7. So perhaps we are to learn to believe and follow the Lord. When you sin, repent, and be patient on the Lord to get the blessings restored. Taking matters into your own hand can lead to apostasy and spiritual death. Despite these blessings, the tribe of Naphtali disobeyed God by living among the Canaanites and by doubting God when God chose them to fight against the Canaanites. However, the tribe did later support the newly crowned King David and also played a pivotal role in building King Solomon's temple. There is a dual nature in all of us that we must overcome. Stay true and faithful within the covenant. When you fall away, return with full purpose and heart, even if it is difficult, and the Lord will bless you, and you will be among those that will see Christ in the first resurrection. Genesis gives the tribe of Gad a very brief mention, noting that he will fight back against raids, while Deuteronomy gives Gad two verses speaking of its expanding territory and importance. The tribe of Gad received the best of the newly conquered promised land as a reward for its faithful obedience to God during the conquest and for the role it played in helping its brother tribes secure their territories. The lesson learned from the tribe of Gad is that we will reap the rewards of steadfastly obeying God. This tribe also teaches us to look beyond the fulfillment of our own needs and help others reach their goals. Jacob's blessing of his eighth son, Asher, foretold material prosperity. The Bible tells us that there were times when the tribe of Asher did what God wanted it to do, such as helping Gideon defeat Israel's enemies, and other times when the tribe did what it wanted to instead, such as refusing to help their fellow Israelites fight against the Canaanites. Like the tribe of Asher, many Christians today are richly blessed and yet often toggle between doing what they know that they should do versus doing what they want to do. 
Scholars disagree on the meaning of Issachar's blessing, but most do agree that being called a donkey is a good thing, as kings rode on donkeys like the Savior did during his triumphal entry. Further, this blessing tells us that Issachar received fertile lands and, upon realizing the importance of that, dedicated itself to working the soil. Perhaps the takeaway from this prophecy of Issachar is that those who submit to the work reap the benefits of their labor. I think this can be applied spiritually as well. To his tenth son, Zebulon, Jacob briefly prophesied, quote, Zebulon will live by the seashore and become a haven for ships, and borders will extend towards Sidon. While we know little about Zebulon the man, we do know that his tribe, as prophesied, lived by the sea and was known for its brave, loyal warriors. Perhaps the lesson we can draw from this is that God values loyalty and valor in the hearts of men and blesses them who have such traits, including those that are willing to fight for what is right and protect those who need protecting. As a reminder, Joseph was Jacob's favorite son. Joseph became the birthright son after Reuben lost the birthright. Jacob gave Joseph the coat of many colors. He was sold into Egypt by his brothers, thrown into prison after the encounter with Potiphar's wife, interpreted the dream of the Pharaoh, and became the second in command in all of Egypt, and then saved his family from famine. So the story of those in the tribe of Joseph, which are both the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, is that we will pass through many trials and then be responsible for the salvation of our family. It shouldn't surprise anyone that the tribe of Ephraim is charged with the gathering of Israel and Manasseh is to assist Ephraim in this work. The work to gather Israel done today will bless endless generations in both directions, extending to the other side of the veil as well. Forgive others, help others both physically and spiritually on their journey to return to God. Joseph, and thereby Ephraim and Manasseh, are blessed with the precious things and the promise to overcome all things. Legrand Richards spoke about one of the most important blessings to those of the tribe of Joseph, which includes Ephraim and Manasseh. He said, quote, I would like to now refer to the blessings given to the twelve sons of Jacob or Israel. Jacob called his sons together and told them that he would tell them all that would befall them in the latter days. I will pass over all of them except Joseph's blessing. Jacob said that Joseph was a fruitful bough whose branches would run over the wall. And we have always understood that wall referring to the great waters. And where was he to go over the wall? Unto the uttermost bounds of the everlasting hills. Is there any theologian in the world who can tell us where those everlasting hills are to which the Lord, through the father of Joseph, promised Joseph that he and his people would go? He further said that his blessing would prevail above the blessings of his progenitors, And his progenitors were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Can you imagine that God would have in store for that chosen one blessing greater than those of his progenitors? And then not provide that a record should be kept and fulfilled of those promises under the great branch of the house of Israel? The Book of Mormon tells us where that land is. It tells us how the Lord moved upon one Lehi and led him with his family and others to this land of America. He promised them that it would be a land choice above all their lands. He commanded them that they should keep records, and for a period of a thousand years the records were handed down from one prophet to another until they were finally buried in the earth, waiting to come forth in these latter days. When Moses gave a blessing to the tribe of Joseph, he described the land that the Lord would give to the descendants of Joseph, who was separated from his brethren. He used the word precious five times in just four verses in describing that land. It is so important that I would like to read Moses' statement. Quote, and of Joseph he said, Blessed of the Lord be his land for the precious things of heaven, for the dew, and, and for the deep that croucheth beneath, and for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun, and for the precious things put forth by the moon, and for the chief things of the ancient mountains, and for the precious things of the lasting hills, and for the precious things of the earth and fullness thereof, and for the good will of him that dwell in the bush. In other words, the Lord who appeared to Moses in a burning bush. Let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. Could you describe a land more wonderfully? A description that would describe this land of America to which the seed of Joseph was led? 
So with Reuben losing the birthright, it was given to the firstborn of the second wife in the Old Testament tradition, who in this case was Joseph, the eleventh born son. With the birthright comes a double portion, and Israel chose to adopt Joseph's two sons, and they split Joseph's birthright, each getting an equal share to the rest of the brothers. In the Guide to the Scriptures, it says, In the last days, the tribe of Ephraim has the privilege of carrying the message of the restoration of the gospel to the world and the gathering of Israel. The time will come when, though the gospel of Jesus Christ, Ephraim will have leadership role in uniting all of the tribes of Israel. If you are of the tribe of Ephraim, your calling is further clarified under Ephraim in the Guide to the Scriptures, which says, In the last days, their privilege and responsibility is to bear the priesthood, take the message of the restored gospel to the world, and raise an ensign to gather scattered Israel. The children of Ephraim will crown with glory those from the north countries who return in the last days. Of the tribe of Manasseh, it says, In the last days, the tribe of Manasseh will assist the tribe of Ephraim in gathering scattered Israel. The youngest son, Benjamin, was quite warfaring. But perhaps we can learn, as seen through the life of Paul, this tribe teaches us that despite hostility towards God early in our lives, if we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, God can spread his message of salvation far and wide through us. Perhaps another way to look for the blessings and responsibilities in the patriarchal lineage is to look at others who were from the same tribe and learn from their lives. Here are some of the famous people from the Bible and the tribes that they come from. This is just a sampling, so feel free to research other biblical characters from your tribe. So what is our takeaway from all of this? How can it bring us closer to Christ? Elder Bednar once said, quote, Your patriarchal blessing with its declaration of lineage will link you to these fathers and be more meaningful to you. Your love and gratitude for your ancestors will increase. Your testimony of and conversion to the Savior will become deep and abiding. And I promise you that you will be protected against the intensifying influence of the adversary. As you participate in and love this holy work, you will be safeguarded in your youth and throughout your lives. I hope this has given you a bit deeper insight into the lineage pronounced upon you within your patriarchal blessing and also given you some approaches that you can use to find additional meaning, responsibility, and warnings that apply to you. Thanks for watching.